Thank you for MDA and the Reed Exhibition for inviting me to uh, speak with you today. Singapore's cosmopolitan identity and its progressive approach to business innovation and innovation philosophy makes an ideal setting to talk about the future of the film business. This is an incredibly exciting time for our industry. But as we know, technological change also brings with it some significant challenges. These days, our homes and offices are all filled with the latest technological devices, and we are constantly distracted by the new technology. The Apple Siri generation will scarcely know a time we didn't talk to our computers. But that brilliance that technology brings us can also be blinding because it's missing what matters most, the content that brings these devices to life. And when I set out on the path that I'm on today, it was with this filter in front of me, seeking out the best creative minds to make any film, beyond any borders, in any language, in any country. This journey started for me when I first began at Fox in 1997. It was my first year, and I was assigned to be the creative executive on Titanic. Fox had spent $5 million funding the research and development of such an enormous undertaking involved to make a titanic, titanic film that could accommodate Jim Cameron's equally enormous appetite. In one of the early meetings, Jim came in to tell us what the movie was about, a movie he had not yet written. Jim, our chairman asked, of course, I know what the movie is. I mean, I know how it ends, but what's, what's the story? And Jim paused, and then he said, I'm going to make you fall in love with six characters, and then I'm going to kill them off one by one. That's the movie. And the simplicity of this singular creative idea matched with the spectacle and realism of Titanic's great descent to the bottom of the ocean brought the film to become the highest grossing film of all time before Jim would surpass his own record when Fox again collaborated with him on Avatar. For me, after watching someone like Jim Cameron's creative expression, his vision, find expression, and accompanying the evolution of that, and then watching the film enter the worldwide media landscape, this is the core of what we do as film executives. Of course, one cannot ignore the substantial funds, the enormous capital at risk, and the need to return that investment that allows for studios to keep providing the support for great ideas that are being created in the first place. Throughout the past century, new technologies have consistently fragmented this media landscape. Today's consumer has access to an enormous volume of content choices, on a wider range of platforms and devices than ever before, both in and out of the home. And that affects our ability to get the attention of consumers. No matter what kind of content, more content flowing over more channels requires that we be extremely adaptable in securing consumer spending. And then there are the stories in the media press about the decline of the DVD market and and, and the perceived threat to our business models. And it's logical with so many new options that to, to consume content that consumers would find ways to adapt to alternative forms of entertainment at a lower cost than theater tickets. But, of course, most challenging in all, of all continues to be piracy. Intellectual theft has accelerated to the point that nearly one quarter of all internet traffic represents infringing use. But despite the challenges, I think they're far outweighed by the opportunities that they bring with them. The business is evolving, both in small steps and in giant leaps. This disruption will always test us, but it's also the key to significant growth. So what's essential to understand is to innovate to make it work for us, because this is the reality. The future of our business, particularly the expansion of the international markets, and the digital distribution represent a great new phase of significant growth for the industry. Our chairman, Jim Giannopoulos, who spoke at Sing Screen Singapore two years ago, found these quotes and he shared with them and I want to share them with you as they're quite relevant for what we're discussing today. 
America's motion picture industry is faced with a powerful and rapidly growing contender for the public, public's leisure time attention. As it is, Hollywood itself is going to die if it doesn't come to its senses fast. Everyone who works there is wondering how soon the whole structure is going to collapse. Nowadays, a night at the movies can be had cut rate at home, and more and more people are choosing to spend their evenings this way. The movie makers are feeling a nagging slump at the box office this year and are resorting to sequel mania to cure it. Let's look at when these were written. So the introduction of new media was often accompanied by these pre pre predictions of the end of the movie industry. In the beginning, it was television that almost drove the studios under until ultimately the studios embraced this new medium is ultimately embraced and is a wonderful new addition uh, for film content. By 80s, the television was, a landscape had expanded to having multiple channels and once again creating new opportunities for entertainment that competed with the movie going experience and yet total revenues to the studios was up. And through the 90s, with the emergence of home entertainment, again, these concerns about cannibalization resurfaced but ultimately, the box office continued to grow. And that same paradigm has continued today. So historically, we can see that new technologies have actually reinforced high quality content and the various forms in which they are delivered. I believe that the same evolution in media and technology that is happening today, while certainly presents its challenges, also provides unprecedented growth opportunities. Today, no matter where you are, chances are that entertainment is within arm's reach. Digital consumption actually isn't replacing our revenue streams, it's complementing and even enhancing them. In particular, the expansion of the Asian markets is what holds the greatest potential. As everyone in this room knows, the international markets have been a huge contributor to the growth of our industry. And as we'll see in a moment, I, I really believe that the best is yet to come. We obviously can't talk about international growth without discussing China. In just the past decade, China has grown from 80 million in box office to 2 billion and is now the world's second largest theatrical market. That represents an average growth rate of nearly 40% per year since 2001, a pace more than four times faster than the country's overall economic growth. Even if the rate slows, it's likely that China will surpass the US within a decade to become the world's largest theatrical market. Looking at worldwide box office, just 10 years ago, the US and international markets were about equal, and today, International box office is twice the U.S. Our movies are doing about 200, our Hollywood films are doing about 200 percent to the, to the U.S. box office. And although the growth of the last decade is significant, it's really just scratching the surface of the potential of international markets. And of course, while the international box office is two times the size of the U.S. today, the international population is 20 times the U.S. But to fully realize the potential of international markets, there are three key objectives that we need to first meet. One, there must be continued investment to build out and modernize theatrical infrastructure necessary to satisfy the increase in movie-going demand. Second, to complement the growth in theatrical, we need to further develop other parts of the downstream revenue model digital home entertainment, and finally, for example, like digital home entertainment. And finally, we must provide audiences around the world with better and easier access to content on a legitimate basis. We need to protect those ideas against intellectual property theft. Last year, Asia as a whole represented 42% of the international box office and 9.5 billion. This is up 8% from the prior year. And that's no surprise given the two most populous markets, India and China, are both representing what we consider Asia. And in fact, when you look at the top 10 international markets today, 
five of them are in Asia. What we've seen in so many developing markets throughout Asia, and in particular in China and India and many territories, other territories that we at Fox are focused on internationally, such like in Brazil or, or in Russia, it's the same, is a reinforcing cycle. As theater going grows, exhibitors invest in the theatrical infrastructure by adding screens and building modern multiplexes, and then movie going increases significantly. And that building phenomena is now driving growth in Asia and other parts of the world. In China, over the last decade, box office has grown from 86 million to 2 billion. And even in Malaysia, where we were looking at since the year 2001, screens have more than tripled and box office grew from 19 million to 190 million. And even here in Singapore, screens increased by 25% while box office more than doubled. And it's important to note that this expanding theatrical infrastructure is characterized also by rapid deployment of state-of-the-art 3D. Here from this chart, it's, um, you can see that nearly two-thirds of all international screens are digital. And of those, more than half of them are 3D. And looking at the markets with the highest percentage of digital screen conversion to date, it's not surprising that four of the top ten are in Asia. And in measuring how this has impacted admissions, it's clear that exhibition and this modernized infrastructure is increasing to a higher level of admissions per capita as well. And as impressive as that is, it's even more extraordinary to consider how much growth potential still exists. As much as screen count per person has increased in the developing Asian markets, it still has a long way to go before it catches up to more mature markets like the US or in Western Europe. So it's clear that when Asia realizes its full potential, it will ultimately overtake Europe and North America to become the largest theatrical region in the world. While Hollywood blockbusters will continue to do well around the world, audiences are aggressively seeking out local content. And in fact, of the 22 billion in international box office, in 2011, local films accounted for 6.5 billion, or about 30% overall, with much higher shares in certain territories. And of the top four markets in terms of share of local product, all are in Asia, India, Japan, China, and Korea. And these are also some of the largest theatrical markets. Japan, China, and India are among the top five and Korea in the top 10. If China continues its growth, and similarly its local product ratio, this could mean a $5 billion local film industry. Of course, one can't talk about local film industry without talking about India. In India, local product accounts for 85% of the box office. 85%. So we talk a lot about the China growth, but the India growth is also extraordinary. And Bollywood may, remains like a religion, the best expression of popular culture there is. India is expected to grow 50% in size over the next three years. And of course, 40% of the population is under the age of 24. What's been interesting is as Indian audiences have access to more kinds of content, we've also begun to see a growing appeal for Hollywood films. When I first started going to India, as I do about every six weeks for the past five years, there were no films in the top 25. Last year there was one, and this year there will be four. Four Hollywood films in the top 25 in India. Fox International Productions India will be lucky enough to have four films in the top 25. Three of them are Bollywood, and one, the newest entrant with Life of Pi. After making films only in English for 75 years, Fox International Productions has now made films in over, four, over 40 films in more than 11 countries. There are over 100 films made, not in English, each year by the major Hollywood studios. But of course, being a whiz at marketing doesn't guarantee you can recognize or root out local creativity. The U.S. studios are guilty of selling themselves to local film industries 
as having the ability to push local content through their vast global distribution networks. And while this is enticing initially, in practice this rarely happens, because what often makes the film local is the very thing that limits its worldwide appeal. One lesson we've learned, find a local partner that's bigger than you. We've taken this approach with alliances and co-production deals in many parts of the world. In India, for example, we partner with our sister company, Star, who provided a huge advantage to us with 30 channels leading in eight genres, including the number one flagship Hindi channel in general entertainment, Star Plus. Star India reaches 400 million viewers every week in seven languages, and it's number one in 17 markets in India. It's been an extraordinary opportunity for us in making Indian films. They may not have known how to make films, but they gave us a unique opportunity to reach consumers and potential ticket buyers directly through their deeply subscribed pay television platform. One can imagine the conversations I had wanting to make films that would make lower margins instead of higher profits, that we needed to put significant resources to develop the smaller markets, and that we needed to disrupt the system in doing so. And in a way, we created the division that very few in Hollywood will ever use. There's a, 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 a phrase by a very smart man named Clayton Christensen, and he, he coined the phrase, the innovator's dilemma. And it certainly applies here, just as it does in embracing new forms of content delivery to the consumer. As he said, embracing the principles of disruptive innovation can be the difference between companies that fail and companies that succeed. And that is especially true in the international marketplace that is evolving at such a rapid pace. The so-called first mover pioneering doesn't solve short-term revenue needs of large companies like Fox, but in cultivating small-scale opportunities like in making local films has been critical to growth and long-term success. I found that once it's implanted within the fabric of established businesses, these disruptions are really no longer distractions from the primary businesses that they may have felt like in the beginning. Now, so far, we've only discussed the international growth potential in terms of the theatrical market, but that's obviously only part of the story. As everyone here knows, studios use a windowing model to monetize content through multiple distribution platforms over time. And earlier, I mentioned the significant, how significant those ancillary revenues are to the overall economic model, and that they're consistently expanding the studio revenue pie. Just to illustrate, for the industry overall, for the theatrical business, it accounts for about 27% of overall studio revenues, with 34% coming from home entertainment. And the remaining 39% comes from television, television distribution. But these downstream revenues are much less developed in many international markets. By way of example, let's look at China. Over 90% of studio revenues today come from the theatrical market. If the growth projections are even half realized, it simply cannot grow in a healthy way without, with only theatrical box office to rely on for recoupment alone. That's why it's essential that we set the right conditions for the development of a robust downstream revenues in China and in Asia, and in particular through home entertainment to realize the full potential of all of the Asian markets. To illustrate the potential upside at a very broad level, in the US, home entertainment consumer spends around $18, about around 18 billion. The international home entertainment consumer spend is only 20% higher than the US at about 22 billion. And as we've seen, the international population is 20 times the size of the US. So the potential is clear. We must dream of making a more robust and valuable ancillary industry in Asia. This has to become a reality. So what do we need to support the development of ancillary markets, both in Asia and, and around the world? I think there are three key requirements. One, 
making compelling, original, high-quality content, whether it be from Hollywood or local or even a combination of both, and having the freedom to do whatever the best creative minds can dream up. Two, technology to deliver it in a variety of ways that suit audience preferences and business models that provide value for both consumers and the studios. Let's look at a few examples in the region. Today, fixed broadband penetration in South Korea is around 95%, among the highest in the world. That compares with 45% in China. But as you can see here, over the next five years, that gap will continue to grow. Similarly, with mobile broadband penetration in Korea, it's actually over 100%, since one individual often has multiple subscriptions and devices. And while China is much lower, at around 20%, the gap is expected to narrow even more quickly than with fixed broadband. And this illustrates what I said just a moment ago about infrastructure. These markets aren't just transitioning, they're transforming. Not only in their taste and what kinds of content they want to go see, but new generations of consumers will in many cases entirely bypass previous platforms because legacy technologies don't really exist in mass. Increasingly, we see generations of consumers that have never used a landline, email, and rarely access the internet, certainly from a PC. Instead, they will just quickly adopt more convenient ways of obtaining content and information. And as more elegant distribution solutions are adopted, consumption will once again accelerate completely unconstrained by the inertia of old established habits. But of course, in order to minimize all this increased consumption, we need to have systems in place that fairly value our content. We, will, we all face the same impediment, piracy, or more accurately, intellectual property theft. To tackle, tackle online private piracy, we need to come to the problem from different angles. First, we need to take action against pirate sites, and governments can help in this with, with initiatives, including site blocking. Second, we need to educate the public on piracy, helping them understand that it's not a victimless crime. Far from it. What's, what's at stake is the development and growth of the film industry in local markets. It's not just Hollywood. This is an issue worldwide and ultimately will damage thousands of jobs and won't protect the livelihood of those who depend today on productions to make their living. And finally, studios and distribution platforms must also do our part to continue to innovate on our distribution. We need to find different ways to access legitimate content that provides convenience and fair value for consumers. As we've discussed, technology indeed is leading a global revolution in the way media companies produce, market, and distribute content. It's content that consumers expect and deserve. And while there are no doubt these are challenging times, it's clear that unique, inspired, creative stories has never been more valued by audiences worldwide. So there we are back at the beginning again, creativity. All of this is only possible with the power of great creative ideas, whether it be from Jim Cameron, to Luc Besson, to Ang Lee, to Feng Xiaogang. And for me, I'm lucky, as I hope we recognize that we all are. We get to work in a business where human creativity is the engine that drives the whole system. Thank you for listening.